Hello, and thank you for taking time to watch this program. The title of the show is drawn from Tibetan wisdom, which says we pick this marvelous and crazy planet to grow spiritually and to awaken. It's said that we have to be brave like warriors to face the uncertainty and challenges of human life. This takes courage to face the rather ubiquitous anxiety and fear of human existence altogether. Being courageous, we discover our nobility and our inherent compassion and wisdom which guides us to solve the challenges facing us. Today I have a frontline warrior who has devoted his life to helping our vets return from war. Dr. Kenneth Hirsch has spent 22 years in our armed services, his last deployment beginning immediately after 9-11. He retired, if you call retiring to a 40 to 50 hour work week, retiring to manage the outpatient and residential services for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorders in the Department of Veteran Affairs Pacific Island Healthcare System. He has been treating post-traumatic stress disorders for 37 years. Thank you, Ken, so much for coming on. I know it was me. a big deal to get you sprung free from, from your work, and I appreciate the person that you didn't see, the patient that you didn't help, and uh, thank you so much for, for coming along. My pleasure. Thank you yeah. for the invitation. No, we met four years ago, or I think we've said it was even longer. Yeah, 2009, I yeah. think we decided. One of those time flies when you're having fun situation. At that time, I, I really didn't understand the extent and the wonderful protocol that you'd put in place at your, uh, at your at clinic, not exactly clinic, but I wonder if you'd talk about the protocols that you're using for post-traumatic right now and also it's a residential program. Go into it a little well, bit. We have for both me. a residential and an outpatient treatment program. Okay. Uh, the outpatient treatment program is much larger mm -hmm. in terms of the number of patients that it's able to accommodate, um, and it uses as much as possible evidence-based treatments. One treatment programs that have been demonstrated by extensive research mm -hmm. to be effective not just hand holding, not just make someone feel better for a few hours or a couple of days and then the symptoms are just there again. Right. Um, the residential program is much more intensive and it's for individuals for whom outpatient care just wasn't sufficient to get a good handle on the symptomology. Right. Uh, it's a eight to nine week program, 12 patients at a time. We use a, use a cohort model so everyone starts together and finishes together ah. so that it's it functions almost like a squad yeah like and a squad we, or and we use uh -huh. that mm -hmm. uh, that sense of unity that bonding as right. a therapeutic tool so they're helping each other in a that, sense that's I mean, correct that, that that's part of it is the bonding that they're used to as as uh, as warriors, as warriors. no matter what branch of service right. in addition mm -hmm. it provides an opportunity for them to provide ongoing support to each other after ah. they leave so they, they learn by teaching in some sense, t learning, teaching to each other. That's right. Uplifting and, the whole situation. And uh, even though they come from really all mm -hmm. over the Pacific Basin, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes from the mainland, with, Amer with modern technology, they can stay in contact and support each other that way, whether it be by a closed Facebook page uh -huh. or something like GroupMe, uh, so that it's... It helps while they're in treatment with us. Wow. It helps in aftercare. Wow, they're in community. That's correct. Uh, and that yeah. itself is a huge therapeutic goal, goal um, because that community is what keeps them going. Now, go through the actual protocols because even whatever that is now, six years ago, seven years ago, I, uh, you were using uh, CAM, uh, complementary we, alternative medicines. Right. You were using kind of traditional uh, cognitive therapy. That's correct. So now, we use, we emphasize actually the um, empirically bound programs or uh, treatment structures and programs that have been demonstrated mm -hmm. to be very effective, but mm -hmm. they don't do everything. They don't take care of everything themselves. So we use cognitive processing therapy. Uh, we use seeking safety. We use present-centered therapy. We've uh, assembled a group protocol. Most of our therapy on the residential program is group-oriented for to address moral injury um, and in vivo exposures to both group and individual challenges. I'm going to slow you down just yeah. a little bit there. In vivo, go, go into moral oh. injury because you mentioned okay. that when, in our conversation, and it was it's a stunning word, moral injury. One of the things that we find that is relatively unique to combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder, and to some mm -hmm. extent, law enforcement-related 
Yeah, you PTSD. said you said this with the police forces are That's showing up correct. with exactly the same symptomatology very, very and same. having to wrestle with protocols as well. And what we find something that is relatively unique to those two causes of PTSD is the fact that the the sufferers, the victims of the PTSD, have either feel that they have either done something which is a violation of their moral code, yes, or by failing to do something have done something which is a violation of the moral code. In the Western world, one of the most obvious things like that is killing another person. And if you think about the Ten Commandments, one of them people think is thou shalt not kill. Actually, mm -hmm. it's thou shalt not murder. Mm -hmm. That distinction has a huge psychological impact. But no matter which definition you use, right. say you shoot someone in mm -hmm. self-defense, mm -hmm. you know, to save someone else's life. Yes. You still shot someone. Right. That takes a toll because in our cultures, and I say cultures plural because it's pretty ubiquitous, yeah. uh, taking another person's life carries with it a very strong moral price. Right. right. And how do you recover from that? That's part of what we talk about uh -huh. when, uh, when we describe the term moral injury. You know, we, we spoke about this, and I ha it seems like as a species, we've been causing harm to one another and killing for our livelihood on some level, our whole existence on the planet. And yet I'm stunned by the fact that it seems that somewhere inherent in our makeup, we know that there is, we do not, when we see something very violent, it's almost imprinted to such a profound extent that we cannot release it. What, I mean, I have to ask, uh, as a human, what is it that you think that has this program on the one hand where we have seen violence or we seem to be fairly, uh, we, have, we have to uh, kill to eat on some level, even if it's a tomato on the way down. There's some sense of that, but there's also this almost universal uh, experience that when it goes too far, it, it deeply sets into your psyche. And what's interesting in support Wait, of What that, is the moral fiber there that's a part of it? We don't know, but it's interesting uh -huh. that you make that point because Historically, even if you look at very violent cultures, mm -hmm. they have difficulties with the same issues. Shakespeare wrote about PTSD without realizing it right. in his play, Henry IV. Uh -huh. uh, Homer, in his two most famous works, right. the Odyssey and the Iliad, the stories of the tragic downfall of Odysseus and Achilles. Well, uh, Dr. John Shea, who used to work for the uh, mm -hmm. VA until he retired a few years ago, mm -hmm happens to be a Greek literary scholar, bright guy. Yeah. He wrote a book about each of those two works demonstrating how the downfall of Odysseus and the downfall of Achilles yes. would be attributed to what we now call PTSD. And these are violent cultures. Right, right. it's but just so amazing, the isn't it? Is the same. Yeah, it's just so amazing. We, our brains, although they have seen this, when they see violence of a certain nature, know that it is inherently not something, it breaks some sort of inherent moral code. Again, you're talking great figures in literature pointing this out. And then you also, I'm sorry, I'm going to have you go sure. back in, vi in vivo. I think Desensitization it, in vivo. Right. One of the characteristics. So we're back down to protocols now. I'm um, to cognitive. That's correct. So we're shifting back to symptoms and how to deal with them. Yeah, protocols. Um, one of the characteristics of PTSD, no matter what the type of trauma that gives rise to it, mm. is a tendency to avoid situations that remind one of the trauma okay. or right. of the feelings associated with the trauma. Right. Well, if you have someone who's avoiding reminders, they tend to stay in their homes. They avoid situations. Right. Uh, if it's combat, mm -hmm. well, there's not much combat going on here in Honolulu, but there are things that remind you of it. If you're a veteran of Iraq or Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, a pile of trash by the side of the road is spelled IED. I had a friend just talk about a patient. They, they saw trash in the middle of the road. They swerved radically to the right, ran into another car. And, and they said, fortunately, the other car was a vet. And he just, he saw IUD. He saw a pile of trash. Exactly. He saw IUD. So there are many reminders just in day-to-day -day living. Uh -huh. And we want to get our our veterans, not just our veterans, because two-thirds of the populations we treat in the, act, in the residential program are still mm -hmm. active duty. Mm -hmm. We want to try to get them to the point where they don't avoid so much. 
So we send them out. We have group activities that are graduated in terms of level of anxiety provoking stimuli. Mm -hmm. And we have individual challenges that are more individually tailored to each one, hmm. where they go out and challenge themselves and they have to sit with the anxiety. And that reduces not just what they feel at the moment, but it reduces the amount of anxiety that they feel when they first go out there. So it's preventative as well as treatment. Right, and then you have classic talk therapy. And you have the group situation going on, the group even, enforcement. But even those classic ones, we use uh, programs and treatment paradigms that are tailored specifically to PTSD. It's not just general talk therapy. So mm -hmm. that if I were working with someone who had a single traumatic event that seemed to be really impacting their life, mm -hmm. I might use prolonged exposure therapy because that has a tremendous wealth of research supporting it in that setting. If I had someone who had multiple exposures to trauma, but no one or two that really was salient, yes. then I might tend to use something like cognitive processing therapy, um, which is also very useful for group format as opposed to individual, and in fact can be more powerful in group. Let, let me also go into a few other things that even when we interviewed or uh, chatted a few years ago, you were already doing acupuncture, auricular acupuncture. Mm -hmm. You were already doing mindfulness meditation. Correct. I think EMDR, uh, eye, um, eye movement, movement desensitization and reprocessing. Has, it has become much more research and somewhat prevalent in it's, the use of the field. It's one of three primary yeah, evidence-based uh, right. protocols for the treatment of PTSD. Those mm -hmm. still lagging somewhat behind mm -hmm. cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure therapy. The other t uh, techniques that are used, whether mm -hmm. it be acupuncture or mindfulness meditation or a variety of others, mm -hmm. are considered to be adjunctive or ancillary. They're mm -hmm. used in support of those three. You say evidence-based. You, you have a lot of experience. What is your view on that person? How do, how do you see them being integrated and used? Even if it's the placebo effect of these uh, uh, other uh, modalities, what do Well, what first you off, I don't... I don't have any problems using a placebo effect. Yeah, right. <laughs> placebo is very, very good to me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I want to make sure that I use those other tools in addition to the evidence-based procedures, mm -hmm. not in lieu of. Yes. Um, and some of them are very powerful, whether it be something as simple as one of the things that we've started using just the past six months or so, um, we use adult coloring books. Oh, beautiful. Wonderful, and wonderful. what we find is that a uh, lot of the guys, not all of them, uh, but actually the majority of them, find uh, that it calms them. In fact, we even call that segment of the program Color Me Calm. And they love it. Some don't. But the ones who do, it's another tool. Mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, uh, yoga mm -hmm. nidra, uh, any number of different things. Um, we Movement. What are you doing in terms of movement? Well, yoga? We have some, we have some um, yoga, but we also have uh, a range for uh, surf lessons. Oh, yes. You said that last um, time. Marvelous. We do have, uh, we, we really stress, emphasize, uh, stress uh, exercise. We have a pretty good gym uh -huh. on Tripler's grounds. Mm -hmm. We encourage our folks to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have one person who's pre reasonably skilled and he can supervise and help them with setting up an exercise. A protocol program. etiquette. That's correct. That's just that's just marvelous, all the things you're bringing together. Now, I know the the other piece, you wrote a paper on this. I hope we have a moment to finish sure. it, is, a, is on a stellate ganglion block. It's a it's kind of a new... Well, it's new for PTSD, but it's not mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a nerve block that you use for pain. Uh -huh. uh, it's been used for certain types of pain syndromes for over mm -hmm. 90 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, a Dr. Lipoff in Chicago noted that it seemed to help with some of his patients who had anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. um, he brought it uh, to the attention of the folks at Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. They did a five patient series there. One of those docs mm -hmm. came here, mm -hmm. he and I hooked up, and we've done a much larger patient series, and now there's ongoing research in it. It seems that, uh, you know, the stellate ganglion, stellate just means star-shaped mm -hmm. ganglions, collection of nerve cells. We each have two stellate ganglions, one here, one here. Mm -hmm. But the one on the right, it's actually more towards the back, mm -hmm. but the one on the right is the major pathway for the sympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. fight, flight, or freeze. So it gets to amygdala or it gets to the deep limbic system kind it, of information? It ties in with that, mm -hmm. but fight, flight, or freeze, which mm -hmm. is 
hyperarousal, adre think adrenaline. Mm -hmm. You know, the saber-toothed tiger is right. chasing you. You right. need the extra energy and strength. Right. That's mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. PTSD, hyperarousal, hypervigilance, not being able to relax, mm -hmm. always being on guard, exaggerated startle response, all of that is a result of the overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. Stellate ganglion block seems to tamp that down. So that's that whole hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, axis that, that I call. That, that you're starting to be directly go into and say, let's chill out here. That's correct. In fact, the saber-toothed tiger is not in our midst right this moment. No, but we have equivalents. Yeah. <laughs> Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Hello, I'm Michael North, inviting you to join us on The Art of Thinking Smart every second Thursday at 12 noon here at the beautiful ThinkTech studios in downtown Honolulu. I'm guest hosting for David Chang of Wellsbridge. Now we're talking to Hawaii's most intelligent, accomplished leaders about what makes them successful in their professional lives. By absorbing their practical wisdom, all of us can think ahead, think deeper, and become more successful ourselves. We look forward to seeing you on The Art of Thinking Smart. Again, I'm really excited to speak with you and have this information get out. You know, we've talked about uh, protocols now, we've talked about the residence program. I want to talk about resiliency, and I want to talk about um, uh, what can be done to make, um, make the warrior feel more welcome when he, he or she gets home. You know, I, I, one of the things I researched on this was how different cultures have accepted their, uh, their warriors back into their culture. Now, we talked about <clears throat> the fact that the armed services is a quite unwieldy situation of, of millions, literally, and that, that, you know, there's a little inner uh, service rivalry that distinguishes uh, brown shoes from black shoes, et cetera, et cetera, right. I mean, Army, Navy, et cetera. But in general, have you explored, uh, and also the military not only known for its acronyms, but also for its uh, rituals, for its rites of passages that are sometimes close to hazing, striping, is one yep. of those. Is there any, any rituals that you think are, uh, now I realize the armed services probably can't get its head around this because you're also bordering it into the quote unquote spiritual or the quote unquote, but is there any rituals that you have seen or that you would advocate civilian, I mean vets coming home to? Well, the problem is rituals are culture based. So I couldn't recommend any th specific or even set of rituals for widespread usage because we are a multicultural society. The military itself has many cultures within it. Um, there are specific cultures that have rituals and ceremonies to welcome and cleanse a warrior upon his or her return. Right. And they are effective within those cultures. Right. The, the American Indians and the Navajos have a beautiful... A variety of you, different... May you come home completely, may you walk in beauty. Correct. Really that welcoming home of a psyche and a spirit. And there are a number of such uh, rituals and ceremonies, but they're all based on specific, relatively homogeneous mm -hmm. and unique cultures. Right. To generalize that, Mm -hmm. to a much broader Western United States culture. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we would do that. Even uh, if you tried to do it just military-wise, right. or just army-wise, or just ranger-wide, right. I think you'd be, it'd be extraordinarily challenging, and I don't know how to do that. I'm thinking more of the actual uh, commitment of civilians to, to welcome within the cultural milieu or within the religious milieu. For instance, uh, I think his name is John Schlager is doing a beautiful uh, work with uh, a welcoming warrior circle home. These kind of ritualistic things that d different churches and spiritual traditions are starting to reinvigorate. Even in my own uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Shambhala, we have rituals for these rites of passage to try to try to make sense or still hold this person that might have that moral injury that you spoke of 
to know that they're being held in love and compassion and care. So I just, as what do you it's see that place for I that think, work? I think it has a very significant role because one of the things that we find commented upon by many of our patients mm -hmm. is no one seems to remember that we're over there fighting. Um, you know, in the <sighs> Vietnam era, we, our warriors were desecrated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now they're ignored. Yes. I'm not sure which is worse. Wow, what a thought. It's just like on the tube over there, we go about our shopping at Costco and everything's good to go. That's correct. Right. And you know, well, you come back from war uh -huh. and ask most of our folks who come back, not just mm -hmm. our patients, mm -hmm. and they get angry because someone gets upset about the coffee's too cold. Yes. <laughs> You're upset about that. That's unimportant. What about our brothers and sisters who are still fighting and dying? Still, yeah, they want to go back whether they have yeah. arms, legs, or any. Uh, and they That's found right. some sort of profound, this is the other kind of contradiction is, although our psyche seems to, to absolutely abhor uh, violence or at a certain point, there's also some sort of profound, profound love and bonding that goes on in the war uh, arena. Right. It seems just... It's a shared yeah. horrific experience. Shared horrific experience. It's like the Hurt Locker. You remember that yeah, movie? Very much Where so. The guy just comes apart looking at uh, 20 different kinds of cereal choices he's supposed to make and in and his mind and, is over there and again one of the characteristic mm -hmm. ex feelings that's expressed is the battle zone is the only place I fit in you've mentioned that that they come back in the, uh, that mind yeah. so it must help also that you have this residence program and that can, they can actually speak I mean every time I looked up the spiritual or uh, uh, you say uh, holistic approach to this one of the things came up was listening. They need to speak and they need to be listened to. And not just in the residential program, but in the outpatient programs mm -hmm. that the VA has across the country. And mm -hmm. we've got 22 residential programs, so it's not mm -hmm. like ours is the only one. Um, the group therapies are very powerful because they can listen to each other. They mm -hmm. have someone whom they know has, has gone there. through something mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. and they can be understood. This is a big question. That, uh, I know you a little bit as a human, as a man. I want to, what, what really motivates you? You've 37 years with this very profound, um, painful disorder. What, what motivates you? Actually, it was a Hawaiian term that put a name to it. Mm. Ho'oponopono. Oh, uh, sorry, it rings. I just spoke of this yesterday. So, it's, yeah, to heal, to make to right. To make right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for 37 years, you've been... Well, it's, we owe it to these people. Mm -hmm. And not just our warriors. Mm -hmm. We owe it to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I do what I do. Owe it to each other. Expand more. Owe it to each other to listen. As people. O owe it to each other to heal one another. Owe yes. it to each other to uplift one another. Um, to help each other live. To help each other be what we can, mm -hmm. to enjoy ourselves as much as we can, mm -hmm. uh, to grow as much as we can, uh, to love as much as we can, all of the above and lots more. Mm. Uh, yes, I'm a romantic. <laughs> Planet of the courageous. I mean, it's beautifully said. Uh, the other aspect I, I wanted to speak about was you mentioned that uh, so much of our police force now is also uh, demonstrating a uh, symptoms of this uh, it's, trauma. It's a lower incidence, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. symptoms are strikingly similar mm -hmm. because the causes are so similar. Right. You're going out, you're putting your life at risk again and again and again. Mm -hmm. You are mm -hmm. underappreciated by the people mm -hmm. whom you are serving. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be understood by the people whom you are serving. So there's a s very small select group with whom you feel you can share your experiences and your feelings very strong analogy to what we find in the military. So the symptoms are very similar. And I'm taking, I saw a study of University of Chicago and then another one done in LA that uh, fully two thirds of people living in, in inner cities right now have seen some sort of violent act that in mm -hmm. fact again breaks their moral injury. And a third of those uh, in this study uh, will have some symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So another question I would have for you is, how is your work and your uh, kind of vanguard 
type of work bleeding into the civilian population, helping well, it? What are the communications? All of the treatment techniques that we use can also be used and are being used in mm -hmm. the general civilian sector. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you can treat PTSD due to a flood or a tsunami right. or an auto accident or a mugging. Use the same treatment techniques mm -hmm. as you do for someone who's been to war and come back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only the type of traumatic event that initiates the PTSD that's different. The symptoms are in many cases the same. Brain's a brain. So the treatments are almost identical. Hmm. And uh, this is setting you up, and I hope, I hope it's a fun question for you. If you had a magic wand, change uh, one design feature in the world, or one... Or one disease? Or yeah, one, one disease. That's actually how I framed it. Actually, oh. it would be depression. Depression. It's more yeah. widespread and takes a greater toll than PTSD. Uh, you know, it's just so interesting. You know, I did, under the World Health Organization called the 20th century the century of anxiety. And they're actually framing the 21st century as the uh, era of depression. In other words, you can't keep up anxiety long before you get <laughs> depressed. So once again, we're, we're back to that kind of ubiquitous uh, fear, anxiety that seems to be part of being human, but seems to be also getting faster with the speed of things and uh, maybe with the loss of uh, uh, the cultural we, we, milieu. We don't have as much of a supportive culture. We've gotten around away from the communities right. where you could draw upon each other for right. support. Right. We still have some of that but it's nowhere near as strong as it used to be. It used to be the norm. You yeah. grew up in a town, right. you stayed in the town, you died in the town. Right. You knew everyone in the town and they knew you, mm -hmm. and you would watch out for each other. Yeah. We're much more mobile. Mm -hmm. We don't stay in the same places, and the places in which we do stay are so large, you don't know everyone anymore. Right, so, so this sense profound sense of lost. isolation. Mother Teresa addressed the UN, said, mm -hmm. one thing I see in your world is you're all isolated. You're all in this fear and pain and, alone. And that engenders individuality to the extent of ignoring the needs of the other. Ignoring the needs of others. So beautifully said. That's just a, I think, somewhat of a wonderful note to leave this on. Is uh, I want to thank you so much. Is there anything that you would like to add, Norm? No, I think we've Can covered I, it. Have we covered? We've covered it so. uh, in a half hour. In with, a half hour. There's more to cover. Well, now, if you want to talk for another five or six hours, I'm sure we could do that. But. Uh,